Excellent. Okay. Um, welcome everyone to the uh, HDN discussion panel. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, this is our fourth quarterly theme uh, and discussion panel. Uh, before this, we've had uh, themes on truth, ethics, and post-colonialism in historical ga games. But today, we're going to talk about the topic of education, learning, and historical games. Um, so before we start, uh, I have to say a little bit about where our funding comes from. So uh, the HGN, the Historical Games Network, is funded by InGame, which stands for Innovation for Games and Media Enterprise, which is a um, £11.5 million research and development centre based in the heart of the Dundee Video Games Cluster. Uh, this is led by Abate University in partnership with the University of Dundee, the University of St Andrews, and local and international industry partners. InGame delivers innovative research and supports, uh, offers re research and development support and services to game companies in the city and beyond. InGame is part of the Creative Industries Cluster Program, funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council and part of the Industrial Strategy. And we also receive significant funding from the Scottish Funding Council. So today we have uh, three guests uh, with us that are going to talk uh, a little bit about um, games and history and learning and education and all these kind of uh, topics. Uh, so firstly, we have Holly Gramazio, uh, who is a games designer, curator and writer. Holly's research interests are in games that invite people to make something creative while they play, or they get players looking at their environment in new ways. Holly founded Now Play This, a festival of experimental games design based at Somerset House in London and running annually as part of the London Games Festival. Her more recent projects include writing the script for video game Dicey Dungeons, which was the winner of the 2019 Indiecade Grand Jury Award, and putting together New Rules, a collection of essays about play during the pandemic. We also have Stephanie Ann Huata, uh, who is a historian with uh, Ubisoft, uh, Ubisoft Quebec, she has been working for the Ubisoft Quebec studio for many years and as a doctor in classics, led the historic research aspects on Assassin's Creed Odyssey, uh, Discovery Tour Ancient Greece and Immortals Phoenix Rising. She also has a strong background in historical tourism and presented a lot of her work to the public and media. Her expertise has since been attached to the procedures by which game developers establish an immersive historical experience by using historical research to enhance the authenticity of, of a, a game world. Finally, we have Cassia Smith, who is a regeneration manager with North Ayrshire Council. Um, previously, Cassia was the regeneration officer delivering on the conservation area regeneration scheme in Millport, out of Cumbria. Uh, Cassia spe specializes in built heritage, uh, conservation and heritage led outreach initiatives and has previous experience in architecture, urban design, planning and building conservation. And is particularly interested in innovation, public engagement and sustainability. As part of the outreach for the Millport Cars, Cassia worked with students from Abate University to create the Isle of Cumbria in Minecraft. Uh, so hopefully some of you uh, have already uh, learned a little bit about our guests from reading the various blog posts we've had over the past month. Uh, but if not, uh, now you've got an opportunity to hear from them all as we go through a few panel questions uh, before we take questions from the chat later on. So diving right in, uh, our first question, what potential do games hold in terms of learning and how much of this is unique to games? So we'll sort of dive right in with the big question. What are games good at when it comes to learning and what is particular about games that allows them to do this? And maybe we could start with uh, Holly first uh, for this question. Sure. Right. It's a big one. Um, I think uh, there is nothing that games can do that other methods can't also do. I don't think there's anything that's specifically unique to, to games about um, learning and education and history, but I do think there are some things that games are particularly well suited to, and those tend to be around processes and, and contexts, how how things work mechanically, the sorts of options and choices uh, that might have been available to a person at a particular time in a particular place, that kind of um, broad sense of uh, process, I think games can be really well suited to, or um, what was a place like, how, how might someone have gone about their day, that kind of very general uh, sense of how a thing worked, right? I think games tend to be quite 
poorly suited to specific facts or the sort of game that's suited to teaching specific facts is not uh, necessarily very good as a game, right? Thinking of, you know, the sort of 1980s video games where you have to shoot down the spaceship that has the correct answer to the question on it. Um, there's nothing that game design is really bringing to that experience. And I think fact specific sort of factually based things generally are not necessarily game's strong point. Yeah, thanks. I, I think that's uh, raises some really good points. This this sort of notion of um, process and the sort of systemic qualities of games being something that they're really good at, you know, it resonates very well with uh, a lot of the stuff we want to know about the past. You know, the the sort of the the both the everyday and the sort of grand scale processes, systems. You know, the structure of everyday life and on the macro scale, how history happens. I can absolutely see that. Um, so maybe we could go to uh, Stephanie now. Um, what potential do games hold? Uh, what's unique about games in relation to this? Uh, I do agree with, with Ali that uh, game is inspiring based on historical element of a learning potential because um, they can provide a better understanding of a geographical and social content uh, related to a specific time in history or a specific location that has been uh, recreate for the game. Um, I think it, it also permits the player to better understand, imagine, and, and interact with certain place, monument. They are no longer uh, accessible or still partially um, seen in our contemporary days. Um, I think what is quite unique to, to game, to, to try to summarize all those idea that I, I provide, I think it's they, they, they own the possibility to engage the player into an um, immersive experience. So the player can actively interact uh, with certain concept of history and central concept of civilization that are present in the game or highlighted in the game. And I, and I think um, this interaction uh, is a great opportunity and is a good comprehensive way um, to learn about history and interact with history. So that kind of uh, virtual heritage experience, in a sense, that uh, games can offer is, is really important, sort of the, the ability to be immersed in uh, depictions of everyday life uh, and architecture, as you said, even, you know, lost um, kind of uh, material culture. Um, but also to take part in it, to sort of feel engaged. Um, and I think that sort of engagement is something very much that uh, your project kind of um, dealt with, Cassia. Um, I don't know if you uh, want to talk a little bit about that now with uh, sort of what, what are games good at? What did you find with your project? Uh, yes, absolutely. I do agree. Uh, it, the games are an amazing engagement tool. Um, and uh, the fact that they can bring what's lost um, they can bring it back to us and they can let us, well, touch it in virtual world and experience it and, and uh, learn about it as well. That's an amazing aspect. But also, it's, they seem to be this stimulating uh, environment that, for example, kids uh, are very uh, fond of. And that's what we uh, based our uh, game on. Uh, that for, for this target group, uh, we decided to go for uh, Minecraft and uh, try to teach them something about the local heritage uh, on this platform. And what's interesting that came out of our evaluation was that actually uh, learning through Minecraft workshops was praised the same at the same level by kids as uh, field trips. So um, it, it's probably um, okay to assume that they both provide the same level of stimulation and excitement. Um, so that 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 was was very interesting from that. Yeah, and I, I find that really interesting when I read your uh, your blog. You know, often you see these kind of these kind of studies done where you ask kids if they like playing video games, and of course they do like playing video games. But in your case, I think when you're looking specifically at engagement and you're comparing it not necessarily to a lesson, but to something like a field trip, which is a very comparative activity, I thought that was a really good method and it really sort of said something meaningful uh, about those kind of kids' kids' engagement. 
Uh, great, yeah, thank you. So, um, yeah, I mean, particularly that engagement issue is, you know, is huge, obviously. It's, it's, it gets harder to talk about sometimes the delivery of, you know, very specific content through games, uh, but the, the aspect of engagement, you know, it, it can't be denied. You know, people get excited when they encounter history in this form and, you know, it's, it's an incredibly apparent and, you know, studies such as these kind of reflections really, really show that. So I think that's, that's a very clear advantage of using games. Okay, so now for the other side of this, um, what potential problems for learning do games introduce and how much of this is unique to games? You know, every uh, media form has strengths and weaknesses, there's stuff it's good at, stuff it's bad at, or maybe uh, maybe that's too extreme, maybe stuff it's well suited to and, and stuff it sort of is less suited to, let's say. Um, what are those kind of things with games in your experience? Was there any problems um, with using these kind of um, sort of techniques to engage people with the past, to try and tell them about the past, or uh, was it sort of plain sailing using games? Um, maybe this time we could start with uh, Stephanie. Sure. Um, I think I, I will twist a little bit the question because I think uh, each tool you will learn um, you will use and will learn history from uh, have a limitation for sure. And they need to follow specific uh, convention. Um, for example, regarding some book, they, they, they can cover a different angle of history or can be limited uh, by a thematic they want to showcase or limited by the format. Uh, for example, we know that encyclopedia will provide a summary of some historical element, and some people uh, will will think that they are offering a limited framework. Um, so I, I think it's it's the same for the game. And um, people that want to use game as a learning tool, I think they need to consider that some adaptation needed to be uh, taken into account to follow. Uh, specific conventions, specific uh, criteria uh, related to the game uh, design aspect. So I, I think it's good to take that in, into account because uh, you will better understand how to uh, use the game as a learning tool and you will focus on the detail and the specific um, element that will provide an, an historical interest. So I, I do believe uh, that game can be a complement to teach history. And I, I and as normally uh, do the teacher, he, he will use different type of tools and book to offer a more adequate and a plural vision uh, to showcase an historical aspect. So um, the potential problem would be to miss understood the format and the limitation of the game. Yeah, thank you. I think that's, uh, I think it's really interesting to think of that in relation to um, games like Assassin's Creed as well, where uh, in educational discourses, you'll sometimes hear people talk about things like cognitive load. You know, there's only so much our brains can uh, deal with at once. And, you know, the environment needs to not be too busy for good learning and that kind of thing. And I, when I think about uh, what you've done with the discovery tour, where you've really narrowed down, you know, that sort of sensory experience so you can concentrate on the sort of historical aspect of it. I really see that sort of uh, echoing that kind of discourse. It's like really concentrating um, it down, the game down to an environment that's really good for learning. Um, so I think that sort of deals with one of the problems problems that uh, games can have, um, you know, as they're designed to entertain and stimulate. That's, that's really interesting. Um, uh, maybe we could uh, go to Cassia now. Uh, what, in your opinion, uh, problems do games have for learning? Is there any sort of issues that arise? Uh, well, the limitations, yes, as Stephanie said, uh, but I think every tool needs to respond to the outcome it tries to achieve um, in every process as well. Um, for what we did uh, in Minecraft, it was um, maybe not as beautiful as, as in Assassin's Creed, uh, you know, Minecraft is very limited in, in a way, but what 
for for the purpose of what we tried to achieve, it was absolutely perfect because it was the engagement, the little bits of information we tried to pass on to students and then through different challenges and, and um, uh, uh, puzzles, riddles, uh, they had to kind of use this knowledge to create something. And it worked very well for, on, on this occasion. Um, I was actually worried um, that the problem may be that the kids will enjoy the game so much that they don't want to do anything else. But that that was not the case. So, and, and as Stephanie said, there are other tools that teachers use in the class or tutors. Um, uh, and that's what was uh, happening. The teachers were uh, carrying on on their own outside the workshops that we had uh, with the kids and the topic basically expanded. Um, in terms of the problems, um, more technical thing would be a license for us, for example, for, for the teachers, for the councils. So um, a license, also the skills, but not so much the, the skills of the kids, but the skills of the teachers of the pa or the parents, as it was during the lockdowns. Um, so um, the workshops for the teachers or, or some kind of um, tutorials are beneficial. And we had some uh, something like that done. Uh, for the game, we had a video presentation showing how to do different things and how to take kids on that journey. But um, uh, one of the feedback uh, was saying that that was kind of not enough because the level of the skill was very minimal. And so for the next time, we know what to do. We know we just need to have a guided kind of tutorial and training session before the lessons start. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> I talked a little bit about this in my blog for uh, the theme. Uh, these kind of logistical issues uh, that are really easy to forget, uh, but, you know, particularly things like teacher training and, um, you know, you see this a lot in sort of working games and learning where you get really positive results in an experiment. And that's because, you know, the person that implemented the experiment is an expert in the game. They know exactly how to get the kids or students involved in it. And then it's hard to reproduce that in a sort of natural uh, educational environment. But it sounds like absolutely you're taking the steps there um, to sort of help with that problem and those, those kind of issues. And of course, things like licensing. Um, you know, the, the boring stuff that no one likes to think about, but is very pertinent to education, uh, very much so. Um, okay, uh, so Holly, uh, what potential problems uh, in your eyes do games introduce? And uh, are these things that are unique to games or are they something you would expect in any sort of learning context? I think some of the problems that are um, particularly an issue with games are related to the way that games, more than most cultural forms, don't really exist until they're sort of lofted into being by the participants. So this sort of thing that just lies there and then you mutually agree to bring it to life. And there's a couple of pitfalls there. One is that it really does require a higher level of buy-in from participants in a lot of other forms. And if it's a, a group taking part in the same game, then you need a relatively high buy-in from a relatively high number of people. Um, you can watch a documentary while other people aren't interested in it. You can read a book on your own in a corner. You can sort of half pay attention and half not pay attention to an exhibition that you're walking through. But if you if you don't sort of buy into the game and start to do your bit in enacting it, then you then it just doesn't work. And in a group that can be even more challenging because if you don't get the majority of people buying into it, then it sort of just becomes this slightly awkward, embarrassing thing that everyone feels a bit weird about. So I think the requirement for really high levels of buy-in is one problem. And another problem that comes from essentially the same route is that when you do get that buy-in, sometimes the, the results are unpredictable. So I do a lot of design of uh, site-specific games, for example, and something that we need to be very, very attentive to in playtests is the ways that people start responding to the rules unpredictably, just to make sure that people don't end up 
doing something that's going to be damaging to historical materials on site or dangerous to them or uh, disruptive to other users of the space. Because once people get their head into the game, once they accept the premise of this um, alternate set of rules, they can really, really get carried away with it. So the unpredictable behaviours of players, I think, is something that it always behooves us to, to be wary of, both in terms of um, their behaviours on the site or amongst people, but also in terms of whether they think of, of different ways of playing the games and reaching the aims within the games that are not intended by by the sort of historical intent. You can imagine a city management game where you're trying to get everyone as happy as possible and then somebody begins doing that because they realise they can get their happiness up by exiling everyone who's unhappy, right? There's all of these uh, ways of approaching rule sets and the aims that we give people that are potentially uh, pull against the historical learnings that, that we might want them to have. So, yeah, just the requirement for people to buy into it and the extremes that they can go to once they have, I would say. Yeah, that's great. That's a really good reflection of you know, that sort of capacity for emergence, you know, the unpredictability of uh, players, you know, that must be so hard when you're working in places that are, you know, designed to be preserved or potentially politically sensitive or, you know, whatever, that, that must be a, a sort of a, a stressful part of the job sometimes, I imagine. <laughs> Uh, also that that notion of buy-in as well that makes so much sense you know it's when we talk about games and learning and games and education you know there's there's a very different thing there you know like if you've got a group of kids in a classroom you've got in a sense a captive audience trying to grab people as they go through a heritage site for example must be a really really sort of different um sort of activity that you have to design for in a really different way so that's a really interesting reflection okay so uh moving on um the third question, are there ways in which educators, uh, governmental bodies or the games industry could be providing resources to help players get more from their historical gaming? Um, you know, what else could institutions be doing to help people have um, sort of more productive in, in, in a pedagogical sense uh, experience of historical games? And that might be in an institutional, con institutional context or it might be just players playing at home, playing games, you know, what could we add? What resources could we add to sort of bring out that sort of capability a little bit? Uh, maybe we'll go to Cassia first this time. Uh, well, I think in, in uh, relation to educators, um, thinking from the perspective of a council empl employee or council service, I think it would be useful if they um, considered uh, kind of wider, more strategic approach at the service level. So in terms, for example, with licensing and in terms of cost of it, uh, um, but also this buying that uh, Holly uh, mentioned previously. This is the buy-in, not in terms of participants that I'm struggling with, it's a buy-in from that kind of level at the service. So uh, the pilot like Cambricraft was very useful and everyone's seeing benefits of it. And then it's a technical aspect of implementing it across other schools or other uh, uh, councils. So those are those technical things. Um, but I think it's more collaborative and more kind of strategic level thinking uh, is required for that. In terms of government bodies, uh, where actually Cambricraft um, it came to life thanks to external funding. It was funding from a government body, Historic Environment Scotland, uh, which was for specific project, which was conservation area regeneration scheme, specific conservation project on Cumbri. But um, some of the uh, outcomes of this project uh, were responded to by the game. It was engaging new and existing audiences with local heritage and also creating opportunities to learn about local uh, historic environment. So um, having that money, we use that tool to address those outcomes. Uh, but in terms of uh, gaming industry, I think maybe in relation to kids again, because that's my limited experience, um, I think um, focusing or, or looking into Scottish uh, curriculum for excellence and trying to develop something around that is the way forward, but I'm sure developers know that already, so. 
there is really those sort of logistical kind of uh, elements and, and the ability to make a sort of uh, a far reaching implementation when you know something works, for example. Uh, yeah, I mean, that, that makes an awful lot of sense. Um, okay, uh, Holly, um, from your point of view, um, what could be done by educators, governmental bodies, or the games industry to sort of help players get more from their historical gaming? Hmm. I have a few uh, little practical ones on this. Um, for institutions, I would say it, uh, you, it's difficult to express how useful it is as a game designer to have access to sort of high quality, um, well licensed images and sources online and the difference that makes to whether you can uh, make a game quickly or whether it requires going off and spending months looking through books first, whether you can um, source um, illustrations images for your illustrators to work with that you know to be historically accurate or not. The Flickr common stuff is great, the Internet Archive stuff is great, anything that is around making resources available to, to be used within games and other sort of uh, works in a way that is well tagged and searchable and the licensing for them is as clear as possible is amazing and incredibly useful. Um, on the part of, of game designers, I think that a thing that we could do more would be to, um, I guess, pay that back by articulating more clearly what within a particular game is historically based and what our sources for that are, because there's a lot of games with a ton of really interesting sort of historical nitty gritty in there that is not well distinguished from things that are only in there to to make the game work or which are um, narratives that are not based in, in history. And I think thinking about that and how we can make clear to, to players and to educators who want to use the games, how we know what we know within it would be uh, something that I think it would be useful for us to do more of. And governmental bodies, I mean, as always, be nice to have more money for things. But I think specifically, there's been a couple of questions in the chat around um, how we assess learning from students and games. And I think an uh, understanding from governmental bodies and funders that that sort of appraisal is, is really important and that that needs to be built into the budgets for these things to enable them to have an impact going on would be uh, a great start yeah absolutely that makes a lot of sense and you know it, it sort of ensures uh the sort of academic community get excited about these things as well when you have those kind of results um so i think that's uh, that's a really good uh, point to make yeah very much so. um and, and it is difficult you know with games because uh so many of them want to create a kind of uh, realist world you know a sort of uh, a fictional world that has this sort of internal coherency that makes it very difficult to offer some kind of meta commentary about you know how the game was made and you know what is real what isn't and you know what what decisions have been made um but i think actually it's a really good time to uh uh talk to stephanie now because of course the discovery tour has has done exactly some of these kind of things yeah i was happy to to work on the discovery tour in ancient greece and to you know enhance that um, research made for the game and for sure the discovery tour um explore in a more explicit and detailed way the historical knowledge that was implemented into the game. And um, we also work with experts uh, related to the historical period of the game. They, they wrote some tour and they're permitted also to highlight some notion of history, civilization, art, architecture that you can uh, also see into the game. And, and I think those tour uh, provide another type of resources for uh, learning from history and uh, providing uh, another type of uh, resource. And uh, those tour also include quiz. Uh, they included also a more info section and they do have uh, iconographic support. Um, most of the time related with some um, museum object 
to help the player to get the most of their historical gaming experience. So yes, I, I think it would be great if governmental body and uh, the game industry uh, continue and provide some those kind of resources to, to help the player to, to learn more about his uh, gaming experience. Yeah, I think that's actually something really interesting about the discovery tour, the kind of quizzes. Um, you know, it's sort of a tool for self-assessment, essentially, for the player to sort of see if they have learned something, as well as being a kind of fun pastime. You know, normally when we play games, we don't really think about what we're learning, I think, a lot of the time. I think actually learning to play a game means ignoring a lot of things. Um, you know, it's about reducing the information you see before you to get better at this one little, you know, mechanic. Um, but in these kind of games where actually the historical information is part of the mechanic, you know, um, I think that completely sort of eradicates those problems, as does the Discovery Tours uh, removal of the sort of more, um, the more embedded sort of challenges of Assassin's Creed. You know, the, the stuff we're used to that can be a distraction when you're playing the main game. In the Discovery Tour, suddenly you can take your time, explore, as you said, you know, it's, it's explicitly about exploring. So I think it's a really interesting um, development, actually, the Discovery Tour for sort of historical games, commercial historical games. Um, speaking of commercial historical games, that brings us neatly to our fourth question, um, which is it better to build games for learning from the ground up or are there any advantages to sort of building on the top of commercial off the shelf games, uh, you know, sort of existing um, intellectual properties, if you like, or existing structures? Uh, and I think I uh, will have uh, Holly uh, answer that first, if that's okay. Well, Obviously, commercial off-the-shelf games that already exist have the great advantage of you don't have to make them, which uh, saves immense amounts of money and time. And the, the disadvantage that the thing that they're aiming to do with the game is almost certainly not what you're aiming to do with your sort of educational purposes. So I think with off-the-shelf games, you can get a really high level of... Um, polish and uh, stuff that already exists there and if it's a, a, a sort of a known quantity um, maybe excitement from students because it's something that they know about or have heard of or want to play because and already care about right you get to skip some of that uh, getting them to be excited about it process and get a little bit of, of free buy-in um, and and the difficulty is that then it's not really educational in itself, right? It's a material that you can use for the purposes of, of education and you have to figure out what your strategies are for that, how you're going to use it, what your intent is. Whereas if you're making something um, from scratch, then that's a bunch more work and way more expensive and likely, um, unless you've got a really high budget to be uh, less um, polished and perhaps less immediately exciting to um, kids certainly than um, some of the commercial games that are available but you can have something that is really laser focused on the uh, things that you want to get across and that you can have tested for and built into it as you go. Yeah absolutely that, uh, that makes a, a lot of sense so particularly that sort of notion of um, the sort of excitement that you can bring with these titles, you know, you, you can turn up at a history class with, say, I don't know, civilization, and you've, you've got a chance that a lot of the students there are going to have played it or are aware of it or, you know, you know whatever, um, whereas it might be harder, again, to get that buy-in, I suppose, if it's, you know, something that they've never heard of and have to relearn or, you know, whatever. Um, yeah, and then, of course, that budget stuff, but then, of course, that targeting. Um, Stephanie, I, I suppose, you know, Assassin's Creed is doing a, a really good job of uh, building in some learning into a commercial product. But um, is there anything that uh, you think you would have liked to have seen in the game if it was possible, but is sort of restricted by the, the fact that it's a commercial game? Or is the Discovery Tour kind of dealt with those kind of issues and allowed a, a, a sort of a broader inclusion of different kind of topics and stuff for learning? Um. But, but at first, I think uh, it's not better, it's different. Um, regarding Cos game, I think it can provide an advantage in the way they can be enhanced by some 
historical element that they can the game. So as you say, and they can be explicitly explained in detail in the discovery tour, for example. But I think when a game is developed in conjunction with information support by an historical research, it will allow a rich and a more informative and for sure a more believable information for the player. So I think it's also useful um, to use those kind of game because they can motivate some discussion around historical concept and abception. Uh, they can also engage um, some interrogation about the way they are uh, recomposed into the game and the way they are used. And if the game is connected with, um, I mean, the cost game is connected with um, the purpose of uh, recreating um, a credible setting or put some support um, and interest into a realist at the art of the game, I think they're, they're beneficial for that. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, there's studies that show that um, even when games aren't necessarily internally a good pedagogical sort of uh, tool, um, you know, sort of commercial games, they often still produce these communities of people that become very engaged with the history. And, and it's a sort of platform or a springboard for more kind of engagement, more kind of community building and research and stuff outside of those games. Uh, and I think that's a, that's a real advantage of the sort of excitement that you get from these commercial games and the fact that, you know, they're fun, you know, <laughs> the, the, the one thing uh, uh, you can always say about a commercial game is if it's successful is it's probably going to be fun, you know, it, it might be challenging or, you know, uh, whatever, but it's probably going to get people excited enough to talk about it at least, and, you know, that kind of discourse is, of course, supremely important, that sociocultural aspect to how we learn about the past is really important, so it makes a lot of sense. Uh, Cassia, uh, so obviously you made the decision with uh, Cumbercraft to um, use Minecraft. Um, what was the sort of impetus behind that? Um, why did you go for a sort of uh, commercial game there rather than building something from the ground up? Uh, well, Minecraft was available there already and kids were already engaged with it. That age group 10, 12, they, that, that was the top priority game they were playing. So that was kind of no brainer to use that. But I think what we achieved was in a way tailor made uh, because it, it responded exactly to what we needed to do to our outcomes that we, we had set. And in a way it took kids on a journey and it provided them with, with information that we wanted them to know about all those heritage assets all along. Um, and then it tested the knowledge uh, uh, within the game so i think in a way although although the the platform is off the shelf but the, the content itself was kind of tailored to what we needed to uh, achieve if that makes sense but i think that kind of strengthens uh, uh holly and stephanie's holly's and stephanie's arguments um that the, the off the shelf content itself is very high level and it might not be as um attractive or as you know in education kind of sense but also just to say um i think adam you mentioned something about um certain type of audience being attracted by certain types of, of type of types of games so i am very attracted i'm not a gamer but you know after reading uh, stephanie's uh, uh blog um uh, post I, I, I really want to try and and play assassin's creed the the, the, the tours because they really really appeal to me and I think they can be really good for, for my kids, for my nephews and um, yes, yeah, so I'm definitely going to try it. Yeah, I can understand that and, and recommend them. They're a, a really interesting sort of thing that's emerged from the, the games industry and we were actually, us that run the HDM, we're talking the other day how surprised we are that other companies haven't kind of followed uh, in, in the, those kind of footsteps because it's, you know, it's obviously been such a, a big splash and, you know, there's a there's a desire amongst players for history now. You know, it's, I think history used to be this sort of a bonus, you know, a bonus to a good game you were going to enjoy anyway. But I think now more and more you see amongst players, there's this craving for like a, a historical experience. You know, it's, you know, I want it to be a good game, but I also want it to be 
an enriching experience historically as well. Uh, and I think that's that's a sort of big shift we've seen as well, that, that sort of change in, in audiences as well as sort of producers. Okay, uh, so I think we've got time for one more question before we move to taking questions from the panel. Um, we've had quite a few questions about evaluating, so maybe we'll save that for the, uh, the chat questions. Um, let's finish then with uh, a question about uh, what role, if any, do you think games should play in formal education? Uh, or is it more important to concentrate on enriching popular play with meaningful learning experiences? So is it more important to uh, make the play that people are already doing uh, more meaningful historically? Or is it important to actually get kids in schools playing games? Um, maybe we could start with uh, Stephanie here. Um, yeah, I think it's a really good question. I, I mean, um, when you develop a game uh, around in history, it raises a lot of question. Uh, and sometimes you need to test certain hypotheses also because um, you don't have all the puzzle, uh, all the missing uh, piece to reconstruct the puzzle. So um, I think um, doing research and connected to a game can enrich uh, the learning experience uh, and the gaming experience. And I think it's also an inventive form of communicating the result of some academic research also. But for example, to uh, recreate in the game a uh, crowd station or a song that you're able to, to listen to or all the historical site that uh, the player will engage with, uh, a larger content quantity of historical data uh, is used and need. So, um, I think you can learn from that because when you will travel as a player through those reconstructed city or place or monument, you will see some object that normally you will see into museum, but now they are re replaced into a context. Uh, you can see crowd station that they are representing some great daily activity. Um, so, yes, I, 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 I do think that um, the role, um, the educating role uh, connect uh, with the game is to dispense historical knowledge during the gaming session. It can be implicitly, but it can so all be explicitly as uh, due to the discovery tour, for example. Yeah, thank you. I think that's, uh, that's a really useful uh, reflection, particularly what you're saying about sort of using the game as part of a bigger research project you know the um i'm sometimes skeptical about the sort of use of games to deliver content you know in in curriculum you know you don't want to replace everything in a school with with games and often you know the early games and learning discourse was that but absolutely you know using it in these kind of contexts where as a springboard for critique for to think about how um how histories are put together, you know, whether that's in game form or in a textbook, you know, the, the process of how these things are constructed and the different experiences and stuff. I think that's a really good opportunity um, to sort of look at popular culture. Uh, okay. And if I may, I, it's quite interesting yeah. that um, when 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 the developer asks some question to recreate a specific sitting or a specific cross station, you need to think in in an active way, not in a passive way. Uh, for example, if you need to um, recreate a merchant activity, you will need to know what kind of good is sell, where they come from, how they were produced, um, how much the you know the people gonna gonna pay for, and did they travel with this good, or did it bring them in a specific place, or did people came uh, into his his house? So it's expose a lot of questions, really useful, and it permits to explore and dig into some historical research uh, that was made by the scholar or go back to some other kind of sources like antique altar for Odyssey or inscription to find uh, the specific information needs. And I think this is something really interesting about the um... The sort of rise of open world games over the past sort of uh, decade or so, I suppose, or a couple of decades, it's, you know, historical games used to almost invariably, if they were 
you know, a 3D environment be set in 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 war zones, basically, because you know it didn't require a lot of um, assets. Uh, it didn't require a lot of strain on the technology to have basically an empty environment that's got a couple of trenches or some ruins or whatever. And it's only with these open world games that you start to see the the social history, the economic history, the sort of uh, domestic life and agriculture and all these things start to creep in, which of course raises all of these kind of questions, these very particular aspects of the minutiae of of historical life. So I think that's a that's a really uh, good point actually. Um, so uh, Cassia, uh, what do you think? Um, is there a role for games in formal education? Obviously you had success with your project. Do you think there's there's uh, more successes uh, to be had uh, for these kind of projects? Definitely. Um, I don't think um, as a tool, it would replace traditional le learning in the classroom, but I think it's an amazing tool to spark an interest. And then that could be supported by other activities, other tools, and that's what we've seen in the classroom. And also it was amazing during lockdowns when the, the, kid, the, the kids couldn't really have any other workshops because this was actually originally developed as a series of workshops, discovery, you know, recording or, of local heritage. And actually they, they've done only archive research and after that they had to have Minecraft. So um, during lockdowns it, it helped a lot, but definitely amazing to spark an, an interest and then take it further and also um, uh, what what our evaluation proved was um, that kids take it with them they remember it better for some reason because it is maybe what Stephanie was talking about you know it's it's visually attractive to them it's it's an experience in, in the other part of evaluation they said is at the same level as actual physical field trip to the museum or other place. Uh, so it, it carries with it some kind of emotion, some kind of, uh, you know, stimulation, and they remember it better. So that could be definitely be utilized um, further ahead. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the, the sort of engagement aspect is, is very clear with these kind of activities. Uh, and I think the advantage um, with that is the the curriculums already have space for engagement activities so you're actually not replacing traditional methods in the sense you're replacing another similar kind of activity which is you know uh you know maybe a heritage visit or whatever and of course it would replace those things entirely but it offers a different kind of uh engagement i think that's uh that's a that's a very clear advantage of those kind of things and also you know i i, I do kind of wonder you know there's always this sticky issue in learning of transfer you know things we learn in one knowledge domain or context are quite hard to transfer to another. I think when you're moving closer to what uh, what kind of domains, knowledge domains, those kids live in anyway, you know, like stuff like Minecraft, those kind of online communities that they sort of live in anyway, perhaps the transfer burden is less. I mean, obviously it would need to be tested, but you know, it, it seems like there's possibilities there. Um, so uh, Holly, um, what do you think is is it more important to concentrate on enriching sort of popular culture learning with games or is it important that games eventually become part of sort of formal education as well i think you know these are all good options right there's not really a, a wrong answer here there's just a lot of um different approaches and different people will have it within their power to make an impression in different areas right if, if you are um, teaching a group of 12 year olds probably you it, most people who are teaching a group of 12 year olds do not really have a way that they can go and convince a large budget video game to um, be clearer about the potential historical learnings right there's just no no mode of communication there whereas if you're working on a big video game you probably don't know any teachers to go, hey, maybe you should bring this into your education. Like, where, where are you already working? Where can you um, where can you make an impact? I do think something that I'm uh, really interested in in formal education is uh, the space for people to not just play games, but also make games. Um, and that can be challenging from a teaching perspective because people don't necessarily have the expertise for that. Um, but there's, you know, board games and playground games can also help with the sort of understanding of a process or, or mechanics. It doesn't have to be uh, a video game to bring that sort of satisfaction of uh, 
thinking about how to express something historically through through mechanics and through play. Certainly, I found that the uh, history that I know best is not the history that's necessarily in games I've played, but the history that I've looked into for games that that I'm making. And we understand with something like writing essays, for example, that um, we don't just give people a bunch of essays to, to read, we also get people to write things. And I think games similarly there's a lot of um still slightly underexplored areas for sort of educational purposes in encouraging people to make things to explore a particular period or a particular area and see what interests them about it and to then figure out how to articulate that and there is an increasing availability of um quite accessible, often free digital making tools. And I'll be really interested to see where that goes over the next five, 10 years. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. I think that's a really important point. You know, we often think about games and learning in terms of consumption, but, you know, absolutely production seems to have a lot of potential. Um, we actually used to do uh, an exercise with uh, PhD students at Gothenburg University when I used to work there, uh, where we'd get uh, a board game, a historical board game like Memoir 44, um, like a relatively simple sort of hex game, World War II game, and then get the students would each get given uh, a different historical battle and they had to mod the game to represent that different historical battle. And as you say, that really gets people thinking about, hang on a minute, what can you do here? What can I represent? What are the limitations? What are the possibilities? So that, that resonates with me from uh, sort of the, the experience that I've had with students with that as well. That makes a lot of sense. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, we're going to move on to some uh, questions from the chat now. Uh, so I see we have one here. Um, okay, uh, this is from Javier. Hi, Javier. Uh, he talks about the fact that in Stephanie's HGN piece, uh, she mentions that visual fidelity helps player uh, players experience emotion. So there's sort of um, the high quality graphics. Uh, and says this requires a lot of studio hours and a high cost. At the same time, Cassia and her team have allowed players to engage with history via Minecraft, which is the other end of the spectrum in terms of visual fidelity. Are there other game elements or features that at a lower cost have surprised you by how effective they are uh, allowing players to engage with history? So what are the sort of the, the bits we wouldn't think make a difference, but are sort of uh, the lower cost elements that uh, have actually helped? Um, does anybody want to? sort of say something on that? So I think it's sort of referring to the, uh, I suppose it's, it's sort of what I talked about in my blog post where on the one hand, it's um, not just how effective is a game uh, for learning, but also the cost of implementation. Uh, and I suppose there's sort of still that balance in in whether we're talking in the games industry or in terms of designing games of heritage, you know, how, and in a broader sense, do we sort of balance those costs? Is there low cost options that can be surprising that we can use? Uh, I don't know if anybody wants to jump in on that. And I mentioned before um, how great it is when people make sort of high quality visuals available to, to game designers to work with. And I definitely think that um, having, having that sort of historical source in a, a game can bring a visual richness even to a very sort of simple and straightforward game can do something where you wouldn't even have been able to commission an illustrator to do things but if you can find the right existing illustrations to go in the background then you still have a way of, of drawing people in in visually so the stuff that already exists in the world i would say can be incredibly effective so that's the kind of things that are low cost to kind of implement but of course you need access as you were saying earlier to those things there's like uh resources that aren't necessarily available even though they are low cost low cost and very effective uh yeah that makes a lot of sense um anybody else want to say something about that yeah sure Cassie. uh maybe just a a point on that maybe there is a chance to um appeal to our heritage uh, bodies to look into into this and maybe you know they may have some funding to provide those kind of 
images. But again, it's about, um, you see, I'm, I'm, I've got no clue what Holly's talking about. So it's about uh, what Holly was talking about before, making this connection and dialogue and explain exactly what's needed, see what funding is available, because there may be some funding available as well. But from the, the heritage perspective, it is impor important to preserve those assets. And, you know, gaming environment, as any other virtual means or platform, is very good for that. So, you know, that, that is the way forward um, as well, you know, alongside our traditional heritage protection. So th there may be a way. Yeah, well, that's a, the sort of the... Uh particularly the virtual kind of worlds they open up a lot of uh, avenues uh, in those terms you know the um the the, the uh, historical material will be completely safe once it's rendered into the sort of virtual world it's endlessly reproducible you know it has like vast access that obviously uh, deals with a lot of um, sort of issues that would arise or concerns that uh, bodies might have with those materials um also what you mentioned with the, those sort of avenues of communication and I don't think we've had a single uh, panel yet on any of our themes that haven't talked about this eventually. That you know that part of the problem is we need to be able to get people together from different sectors that are all working essentially with the same problems a lot of the time and uh, available to talk to each other. But of course, I think the the fourth sort of um, group maybe that we miss from that. You know, we have heritage people, games developers, games industry people, and um, uh, and. Uh, uh, all sorts of uh, different groups that are sort of involved here, but of course funders is of course, uh, and, and institutions is the hard bit to sort of get access to. Uh, and obviously there needs to be lines of communication there, uh, particularly to funding bodies to who uh, games might still be a dirty word or, you know, something they wouldn't have considered with, you know, in terms of heritage or learning. Although I think that's increasingly uh, becoming less of a problem. Okay, uh, so we have another question here. Uh, from Eduardo, who says, uh, narrative directors, transmedia managers, business developers, editors, writers, illustrators, many, many internal and external creative people merge their efforts into developing stories that enrich the game universe. Um, uh, how much does the role of the historian and the historical aspect, like research, settings, feel, and mood, um, how much can they impact the transmedia storytelling aspect of the franchise, like, for example, the board games or audiobooks of the saga? Um, so I guess that's uh, probably mainly a question for Stephanie. Um, do the historians at Ubisoft have a role in um, the wider world of Assassin's Creed? Is, is it something that you, uh, you would take part in for the novels or the spin-off games or things like that? Or is it sort of more uh, compartmentalized? No, it's more compartmentalized. I, I mean, my role is to help guide uh, the development team to uh, have access to all the information that they need to recreate a specific historical element into a game. So that, that means um, I also need to understand what would be the process and how they, we, how they will be implemented into the game. For example, if someone is asking to recreate a crowd station, uh, I will understand that you will need to also have information about the gesture that the people uh, have during that time period or how they behave. Um, so yeah, my, my, my goal is to do some research, um, help to guide the team uh, most, most of the time and answer a lot of questions, but they are so interesting <laughs> that it's it's really it's really a, a fun uh, way to to do research. Yeah, I can I can absolutely imagine, and I suppose um, given that your sort of team at Ubisoft, if you like, or the you as a you as a collective uh, develop these games, and then they serve as the springboard for the other sort of side uh, products that might come off, you know, like the, I don't know, the novelization of whatever. I suppose they're still using that research actually, you know, because they'll be inspired by the game to produce uh, another franchise. So I suppose that that's a research filter through to some degree to this sort of wider world of Assassin's Creed, if you like. Um, okay. Um, so we have a question from uh, Tess. 
who says, I'd love to hear everyone's thoughts on Blackhaven uh, and other games setting the player in a museum space in order to convey historical meanings, not just about the past itself, but about archives history making as well. Is this a promising future angle or too niche as a concept to become a big popular trend? Uh, you check your email as a task. I found that a cool mechanic for giving instructions narratively, but apparently some found that boring, haha. -ha. So I guess the question is here, is there room for making games about making history uh, as well as making games about history uh, in a sense? You know, uh, maybe uh, Holly, for example, can you see a point when your job becomes a game in itself? You know, the, <laughs> the games designer uh, simulator? Oh, wow. Uh... I can't quite loop around those those, those thoughts. Um, need to sit quietly with that, that aspect. But yeah. I do think, um, yeah, I haven't actually played uh, Blackhaven, but it sounds super interesting. And it sounds like it's um, done really well at drawing people into this kind of experience of what it means to to work in a museum, to be in that sort of space and the processes of, of history making. And I do think there's plenty of scope for more games to do that kind of thing. I don't think it's going to be, you know, the, fir the next uh, mega genre that sits alongside platformers, first person shooters, racing games, and, you know, third person museum simulators. But I think there's definitely scope for, for more stuff that does talk not just about the, the history itself, but the processes whereby it's communicated. And um, I think, you know, checking email is maybe boring for some people who have to check email all of the time, but, you know, sweeping is boring. And that doesn't mean there aren't a lot of kids who are excited with their tiny toy brooms, right? Playing at being an adult is definitely something that, that kids enjoy in whatever form. So I don't think the fact that you would have to find a way to fictionalize and, and make games out of slightly tedious tasks rules that out at all from being something that's worth more exploration. Yeah, particularly, as you mentioned, with with kids, I can imagine that, you know, being some, something that sort of paradoxically appeals to them, actually, you know, what does it feel like to run the museum, maybe, or, uh, you know, mm -hmm. to try and communicate history to other people. And you can see that as a, you know, that could be a great uh, springboard for a lesson on thinking about how history is made and communicated and, and sort of shared um, very much. So I think uh, I've often, it's a great question, that actually, I've often stopped specifically when I'm in a game or a, or a historical game that has a museum because I think that's where they really get to say hang on a minute this is what we're doing uh, basically and it's, it's a real moment for uh, self-reflection I actually think the Assassin's Creed series did it the best um, where I think it was in Black Flag they had uh, Abstergo uh, Entertainment so they had a fictional games development company that you worked for to mine the past for interesting things uh, while you played a game by a company that minds the past for interesting things, which I thought was a really brave and sort of clever, reflective move. Uh, I've, I've always wanted to write about and never got around to. Uh, but yeah, I think that's a really good example of that. I haven't played Blackhaven either, but I think there's a lot of room for games to talk about how they make themselves, uh, if you like, because um, I think that's something kind of relatively unexplored. I don't know if uh, Stephanie or Cassie wanted to say anything about that, that sort of idea of museums or history making as a, as a topic in games at all. Uh, maybe in terms of the museums as a uh, virtual museums as again another way of presenting a heritage that's obviously very useful and I know that some uh, um, they, they do exist some exist um, but I'm not sure how 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 to present it how to get that buy-in so again through the game as you were saying Adam that's quite quite good uh, way of introducing it or uh, for example, some museums were shut for the lockdowns, so, you know, they had those virtual spaces and you could access them during the lockdown virtually. Or maybe, you know, there is an increase in heritage tourism. So um, if you before you want to go and see the museum or what exhibits it's got, you can see it virtually. So maybe that's a promotion of it as a promotion for the museum, for some audience from, I don't know, from across the ocean that want to make that judgment call before they come, maybe. Maybe useful. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and in terms of accessibility as well, um, you know, for 
um, people that maybe don't have the ability to go to the museum uh, very often, whether that's for uh, because of disabilities or for socioeconomic conditions or whatever. I think there's there's great opportunities there, and I think I think in some sense historical games are already sort of offering that to some degree. You know, they they offer uh, opportunities through a piece of technology that a lot of people have in their house now uh, to people that maybe don't have the opportunity to go and do things like that on a regular basis. I just also wanted to say that I think that fictional museums in video games offer a kind of freedom to explore this that isn't necessarily the case working in um, actual museums. It's almost uh, become a, a cliche of the sort of playful things that people will propose for museums of, oh, you can curate your own collection, you can put together the 10 things that you like most or the 10 reddest things or whatever it might be. And it's not that that's not a fun way of looking at the stuff in it, but it doesn't really have any scope to dig into the, the processes of the museum and doing that within a, a fictionalized museum space, I think is potentially really exciting and just allows so much more, more freedom and the capacity to question some of that decision making in a way that uh, you can't really do within the sort of formal spaces. Yeah, absolutely. I see that point, you know, completely, you know, I've seen exactly that in museums, you know, pick the 10 items that you would choose as a curator and it sort of misses the whole point that curators don't just get to pick the items they like the most. <laughs> you know, that there's all sorts of pressures and uh, different stakeholders and things that the exhibition needs to be doing to please different people. And yeah, so uh, without that kind of context, um, it doesn't really make much sense as a sort of activity. But you can absolutely see a video game where all of that stuff is stuff you have to manage, you know, in, in the classic management sim style uh, that could make some a really interesting points about, you know, how history is constructed for the, for the popular audiences. Okay, so uh, unless anyone's got anything else to say on that, I think we've got another question here. Yeah, I just, I just want to yeah. add that. Yeah, please. Um, during, you know, from, from a few, few uh, years from now, uh, I, I did um, see a growing interest and a growing benefit uh, regarding virtual the construction of certain monument or, um, or site, and it's really tangible even on physical site. Uh, for example, when, when you go visiting the, the Arapakis in Rome or, uh, or Olympia, you can rent some virtual tour based on some reconstitution. So I, I think uh, they have um, an awareness and uh, an interest uh, um, to, to use uh, virtual reconstruction and to, um, because they, 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 they make um, the player or the visitor um, a more immersive engagement and help to better understand the place and the monument visit. And, and sometimes it's possible to see the full um, site reconstructed, uh, which is not uh, always the case when you're on site and you see only ruins. So I think it can provide an interest of this type of engagement for the player, but also for for the visitor or the tourist who will uh, use and and learn about virtual reconstruction. Yeah, absolutely. You know, so you can it's sort of the you've got the two directions there. You can have a virtual world that tells us about the sort of realities of the museum, and you can also have the museum tell us about the realities of of what the sort of virtual can do uh, in relation to heritage and sort of uh, both the limitations and possibilities of that. Again. Um, and that's something I've really noticed in um, sort of contemporary museums. There's more and more of that kind of reflection on what is and isn't possible to be told with a collection uh, or with a sort of virtual tool. Uh, I've noticed that over the past sort of, you know, maybe five to 10 years, you, you increasingly see those kind of questions emerging in uh, institutions that would have traditionally been very authoritarian before. Uh, and I think that's really interesting that we start to see that in, uh, in traditional heritage environments, but also increasingly in video games as well, uh, where you get this sort of questioning of the form itself and, and then what it's capable of. Uh, so we have another question. Uh, this one's for Stephanie uh, from Angus, Angus Moore. Uh, the discovery tours are impressive, knowledge-driven experiences of the past, which take, I have to guess, significant corporate resources. Uh, can you speak a bit about Ubisoft's business model and or corporate strategy behind the discovery tours? 
Uh, I realize that this question cannot be answered in detail because of non-disclosure competitive reasons. Um, so are you allowed to say something about sort of, um, yeah, Ubisoft sort of strategy behind this intention, um, the, the idea basically, I suppose. But the idea beyond the Discovery Tour is to um, permit it to the player to um, discover another way and interact in another way with the historical knowledge and the historical information implemented in the game. Um, for, ex for example, the location in, in game of Dying Workshop in Kitera, historically uh, known as the Purple Island, uh, permitted to demonstrate visually um, in the game, but more explicitly in a tour, in the discovery tour, the process and the extraction of this uh, precious substance. So, um, so through the props, uh, through the layout reconstituted, the crowd station and some reconstitution around uh, those things, the player can understand in one look in the game, but can uh, learn from it and more explicitly into the discovery tour, what would be uh, to Murex fishing and the process related to the manufacture of dice. So the whole idea with the discovery tour is permitted to NS uh, all the historical research, research that was implemented to the game and permitted the player to discover it, um, it in another form without doing combat and you know, with the with, um, purpose of choosing a uh, different tour uh, for different thematic. So for the other part of the question, um, honestly, I, I think they have other better person in, in Ubisoft, they are taking care of it. Um, on my side, I only take care of um, highlighting the historical notion uh, that can be implemented into the discovery tour. Yep, thank you for that. Yeah, I mean, I, I can, you know, we can talk about the broader sort of uh, more obvious sort of uh, appeal that something like a discovery tour would would have. And, you know, you can see it's a it's a very good way to expand an audience to maybe an audience that wouldn't play Assassin's Creed games normally. Um, you know, exactly, you know, I can see a, uh, a sort of gesturing there. Um, I, I think it's a great way to sort of expand an audience and maybe offer an extra form of kind of appeal to, um players that already will play the game anyway, but if they can spend those extra few hours of the Discovery Tour, maybe they're more likely to come back to the Assassin's Creed series. Would those be the kind of things that uh, Ubisoft would be hoping for, I suppose? Um, for me, I think the main goal is that all the research that was done for the game can be used in a different way into the Discovery Tour. So it's more about that, to, to provide another way to learn and detail and um, make sure that um, the player can uh, complete his uh, historical uh, gaming experience. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, absolutely. You know, all of this stuff you produce, it's, it must be, you know, it must have been frustrating in previous games to not be able to use that and communicate to the player. So it makes a lot of sense to have a mode for that. Um, okay. Uh... Hang on a minute, sorry, we do have a question here somewhere. I'm just going to scroll through the chat. Uh, let me see. I think there is a question here somewhere. Um, there we go. Here we go. Uh, what are your thoughts about games addressing controversial historical topics, uh, such as slavery or domestic violence, etc.? Uh, and what are the what are the risks of trivializing these aspects, and how could they be included, used in educational games? Uh, this is a topic we you know we we often come back to because, of course, particularly when you you're trying to teach you know particularly children about Nera, um, you don't want to whitewash things out of you know, the, the context, but also does every sensitive theme work in, in a game or do some of them uh, not well suited? Um, yeah, so what are your thoughts about games addressing these kind of controversial historical topics? Um, I don't know who uh, would like to say something about that. 
Um, it's something I've sort of uh, written about quite a lot in uh, my work, um, particularly looking at the fact, for example, that the uh, the Holocaust is almost never in World War II games, um, because obviously developers um, um, very sensibly worry about sort of trivializing it by including it in a game. And of course, then the problem is you get this whole body of work that purports to tell players about uh, World War II that misses out on a hugely important, uh, significant historical and sort of cultural event. Uh, and it's sort of the tension between those elements. Um, I, I guess it's uh, a, a question in games design a lot because, you know, history is full of not very nice things. Um, is this... Uh, an issue. Um, Holly, is this something you've ever encountered in your sort of um, work with her heritage science? Is there anything you find that's like, oh, maybe this is a, a good uh, thing to get people hooked? And then, oh, is it a bit much for all the audience? Or is it is it sort of easy to make those decisions? Um, there are certainly um, calls for um, proposals for historical games that I've not responded to, either because the, the subject matter didn't seem I couldn't see a way for the subject matter to uh, be a good match or it didn't feel like I would be a, a good person to be making that game. Um, I think I don't think there's anything intrinsically trivializing about something being a game. I think there are a lot of games that treat um, that treat very thoughtfully uh, a lot of different historical issues with the Holocaust, for example, I guess uh, the big issue, the big example there is Brenda Romero's train. Um, but it's already a, a bunch of challenges to have a game that is functional as a game and that is educational and that ideally is fun, right? Like it's not that I think games necessarily have to be fun to be good, but if you're using them for an educational purpose, probably part of what you're trying to do with that is to leverage fun, which is something games do well to engage people. And then to also add to sort of engage respectfully we, and in a non-trivializing way with um, sometimes really grim subject matter is very challenging and I think there are I wouldn't say that that oh it's impossible about any subject but I would say that there's a lot of cases where it's very difficult and that it might make more sense in an educational context to use a combination of, of approaches where you cover some stuff with games, you cover some stuff with discussion, you cover some stuff with documentaries, whatever it might be. And yeah, our games are not always the, the obvious go-to for particular subject matter. Yeah, that's it. I, I, I would agree with you. It's like, I, don't, I don't think there's any topic that games couldn't. Um, sort of cover if it's the right mechanics, maybe the game's built from the ground up to deal with that one particular issue or whatever. Uh, it's way more difficult, obviously, to squeeze it into existing sort of game design patterns or whatever. So I can absolutely see that. And it must be a, a really difficult thing. Um, and I think the uh, matter of people behaving unpredictability unpredictably within the context of a game becomes much uh, more of a serious matter when the game is about, for example, slavery. Like you don't if people uh, behave unpredictably in a way that is um, about a game that's about a medieval parade, then kind of no harm done. But uh, being able to be aware of all of the different ways that people might uh, find unexpected ways to win or mess around with the rules or get carried away or whatever it might be as much with challenging subject matter as uh, like there's that the failure modes for that are so much worse. Yeah, ab absolutely. We sort of talked about this in the research we did on uh, games sort of triggering controversy by in including sensitive topics. And that's one of the things that came up. It was either a fear of trivialization or this fear of what we call the playable position that, you know, if you give someone the role of the Nazi or the, you know, whatever, whoever the historical perpetrator is, it raises all sorts of problems about, you know, we cannot predict how they interact. And even is it appropriate for a person to act in those roles? And, yeah, absolutely. So that's, that's very much echoes to what we found uh, when we looked at controversies. 
Uh, Stephanie, I wondered, was there, is there ever been a time when there's been something you wanted to deal with in uh, sort of Assassin's Creed, but uh, it's kind of not appropriate for a larger audience, maybe, that uh, Assassin's Creed would um, sort of typically draw, or was it sort of you could include everything you wanted uh, about the sort of darker aspects of sort of classical history? Yeah, uh, as an historian working in a game industry, I, I don't, um, I provide all the information that I think it, it can depict the historical historical period that, that we choose. Um, but uh, for any historical period, we are really attentive uh, to analyze all the information and replace them into context. So I think this is something really um, important to put in context and analyze all the sources that you want to uh, use for. And, and we, we also consult various experts and develop various way of en engaging in cross-cultural di dialogue or dialogue about some specific uh, historical event. Um, so now on my side, I, I do I do my research as as a scholar will do a research. Yes, thank you, thank you for that. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Absolutely. Um, okay, uh, Cassia, did you want to add anything to that? Was there anything that you wanted to include in Cumbria Craft that you couldn't because it was for kids, or was it? Was it pretty easy to? Uh... It was pretty easy because we had a heritage trail around the island, and we just based our discovery trail around that. So there was no issue with anything. Ah, okay. Well, that's that's the perfect solution if somebody else has already uh, selected the bits. <laughs> um, I mean, because you know, it's particularly when you um, you're trying to create something for kids. You know, I mean, the the horrible history sort of series has proven that kids love the. They love the dark stuff, right? You know, from the past, but obviously it becomes way more difficult when you're talking about these very contentious issues, like sort of uh, slavery and genocide and stuff. And you, you want to engage their interest in the right way um, rather than um, it's sort of, yeah, being seen to trivialize these kind of really important issues. So yeah, and it's, it's certainly a, a tightrope to walk for any kind of uh, game developer. Uh, okay, so we have one final question, I think, uh, from Nick. Um, a question about the connection between memory and history in games. Uh, many traditional or folk games, particularly singing games, incorporate historical information. Uh, Ring a Ring of Roses, for example, in a way that might not be immediately obvious, but captures memory in some way. Um, are these games part of this same discussion, or does the formal design of games for historical purposes make them different? Um, so when we talk about games and learning, can we also think about these sort of folk games or these games from the past that have previously carried information um, to um, sort of audiences or are we really focusing on the sort of contemporary uh, uses of games? That's a tough one Nick I think. Uh, it is it's quite interesting actually you start to see uh, a little bit more research um, on this kind of thing the sort of board games from the 19th century uh, and things like that uh, particularly morality games yeah, you know, so you have these like snakes and ladders imitation games that um, uh, about teaching people sort of proper morality according to various religious uh, sects, and you sort of make your way to heaven or hell. Uh, but it's actually something that people haven't really talked about a lot. Um, has that come up for you at all, Holly? Have you come across any games in these kind of heritage places or games that were played there that you wanted to include in your um, sort of your own yeah. uh, engagement? Yeah, it's an interesting one. I do like to, if I'm designing something for a specific space, I do like to know what was played there in the past. I did something at um, for a local park a few years back now that was around um, designing games to play in the park and printing those on hoardings with a sort of a nice visual design. And as part of that, we looked into sort of historical records of play around there and um, reimagined those. I think what I've tended to find is that um, games from historical games are in some way not appropriate for just flat out play. Like a lot of past playground games are 
incredibly dangerous and involve like oh throw the knife that you have because everyone has a small knife into the ground between the feet of your opponent but don't hit them on the feet if you do you lose but make sure you get it between them or there's um sort of gambling involved in them which is also obviously contentious or you will have say a 19th century board game which has a very very uh gendered sense of what appropriate behavior is and it's not that that's not still interesting to to look at and obviously you can play that without buying into it but ideally you know don't don't make a bunch of people play a game that tells them they're doing their lives wrong right um even if you then go but we don't believe that now so there's a lot of um historical stuff which is interesting and useful as a, a material to discuss or look at but isn't particularly a thing that um, is great for just getting people to to flat out play um, occasionally there are especially with sort of playground games and chance and that kind of thing like you say things which um, are both fun as a game because that's another thing about these 19th century games and mostly very boring if you're over the age of seven they're like roll a dice and move along um it's a little bit later that you begin getting actual interesting decision making in most board games so fun um appropriate and um communicates the sort of specific educational things that we want to communicate is rare but not impossible and when you do get that overlap then you know that's very exciting yeah i can absolutely see that and you can imagine that the amount of work it would take to contextualize some of these games would probably often outweigh the the benefits they would offer <laughs> okay but uh, you can also sort of use use some side long sorry i know we're um near the end of we very quick but so there's um in lots of parts of Scotland, there's a game of uppies and doonies, which is a kind of historical football game played within a particular town where the people who live up the hill play against people who live down the hill once a year, often around New Year and some of the northern bits of England as well. And that's not widely played anymore, but it's a, like a fascinating thing that used to happen, right? And I did get in Edinburgh 10 years ago to to do a, a giant game across the city inspired by that and most of the people who took part probably weren't super engaged with the the, the history of that and just picked uppies or doonies because they liked the giant wicker statue that we had for that team but we did have the commentators who were running it touch on this and having that element of history is something that people who knew about it or had heard about a game like that from their grandparents I did get some feedback around how how that did feel valuable to them that it was embedded in this specific historical game that had happened in that area yeah I can imagine that and also it being a a kind of reenactment, a competitive reenactment activity that the outcome wasn't decided already, you know, because a lot of the time with traditional reenactment, you know, they go into a battle, but we all know who wins the battle or it has to be decided before for safety reasons or whatever. So I can imagine, you know, that kind of reenactment of old games and sports is a kind of a very pure reenactment experience in a sense. Okay, uh, sadly, I think that's uh, all we've got uh, time for. Um, so let me just say thank you so much to uh, Cassia, Stephanie and Holly uh, for joining us. It's been a really great discussion. Uh, and of course, um, thank you to our audience, uh, to everyone that's uh, read the blog and joined us today. Um, thank you very much. You know, again, you make the work of the HGN worthwhile. Uh, we will be moving on to our next theme uh, shortly and we will have uh, a call um, for um, uh, submissions for that soon as well so uh, stay tuned to the uh, HDN to uh, see more about that uh, so thank you very much everyone for attending today um, and thank you very much to our, our panelists thank you <laughs>